We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We encourage you to share in the chat the Aboriginal land from which you are joining us tonight. Also, we acknowledge that it is possible something you hear may be emotionally challenging for you. We encourage you to reach out for support if this occurs. One resource is Beyond Blue. They are available 24 seven and their number is 1300 224646. That's 1300 224646. Now to some housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. There are a couple of webinar functions we encourage you to use tonight. The chat function is on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Simply click on the icon to use the chat. It would be great if you haven't done so already that you tested the chat function by sharing with others where you are reaching us from tonight. Next, the Q&A function is on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Similarly, click on the icon to open the window, type in your question and press enter. You can also upvote questions by pressing the thumbs up icons. I'll now give a brief introduction to the toolkit which sits behind this series of webinars. The Green Rebuild Toolkit is a project from Renew, a member-based nonprofit organization who have provided Australians with expert independent advice on sustainability since 1980. Renew also publishes two leading sustainability magazines, Renew and Sanctuary. Through this work, Renew has worked directly with designers, architects, and sustainability experts for over 40 years. The devastating bushfires of 2019-2020 prompted Renew to share some of the expert resources that have been collected along the way. And so the Green Rebuild Toolkit project began. It is intended as a platform to share Renew's expertise, to amplify other projects and people doing good work in this space, and to share stories of those rebuilding. The toolkit can be found online. It is divided into eight sections that walk readers through the process of rebuilding. You can read it chapter by chapter or jump to sections that interest you. Throughout it, you will find expert feature stories, buyer's guides, and case studies. There are also many links to external resources, which you can find in the blue boxes in the margins. Importantly, the toolkit is designed to grow and evolve. If you know of a project that you think should be included or would like to share your own rebuild story, please follow the links on the website. Now to tonight's program. We are having three speakers tonight. They will each speak for around 10 minutes after which we will have a Q&A, responding to questions that you have posed in the Q&A function on your screen. I'll first introduce myself and then our, free, our, our three panelists for the evening. For those of you who have enjoyed all five webinars so far and have listened to me introduce myself with the same story every evening, I'm only going to say a few words of introduction tonight. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. All webinars will be added to the Green Rebuild Toolkit within the next couple of weeks. You might like to check out some of the others. I'm Tricia Hiley. I live in far eastern Victoria in Malakuta, a remote coastal community profoundly impacted by the 2019-2020 bushfires. My whole family, my husband, children and grandchildren were here together on New Year's Eve 2019 and the days and months afterwards. One of my several com volunteer community commitments is being the coordinator of Malakuta's Sustainable Energy Group. I also consult part-time with a focus on helping individuals, organizations, and communities create sustaining futures. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker is Nigel Bell. Nigel is principal of Eco Design Architects, working from the bushfire-prone Blue Mountains, New South Wales. He has been involved over the last 20 years in bushfire education, writing and presentations, with over 30 years as a leading architectural practitioner in balancing sustainability and bushfire requirements. 
Nigel facilitated community bushfire recovery through 2009, following the Victorian bushfires, 2013 in the lower Blue Mountains, plus extensively through the wider grounds in 2020. He has represented the Australian Architect Institute of Architects on the three Australian bushfire standards and as an expert witness to the 2020 Royal Commission. Nigel will discuss broad considerations for retrofitting homes. Next, we will hear from Paul Dolphin. Or Dolphin? Dolphin. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Paul is an accredited building designer, the owner of PDD Building Design, and has specialized in sustainable and resilient design for over 20 years. He has built an award winning solar passive home and office in Malua Bay on the New South, New South Wales South Coast. In the immense bushfires of 2019, 2000, or 2020, he had to evacuate his family numerous times and the fires burnt up to his front door. His house survived because of equal parts, good design, good landscaping and good luck. The southerly wind hit just as the fire reached the front door. Paul will discuss key issues, excuse me, key issues that reduce bushfire resilience and how to retrofit homes for bushfire resilience. And lastly, we will hear, hear from Alan Pears. Alan is a longtime contributor to Renew Magazine through his regular column and occasional articles. He has been involved across a broad range of sustainable building policies, programs, and on the ground projects, and on many community projects. Alan is a senior industry fellow at RMIT and a fellow at Melbourne University's Climate and Energy College. He works with the Australian Alliance of Energy Product Productivity, Energy Efficiency Council, Climate Alliance, and many other groups. He has a strong interest in appliances, behavior, distributed energy solutions, and lots of other areas with a focus on energy efficiency. Alan will discuss retrofitting homes for energy efficiency and climate. Before Nigel begins, I'll just remind you that all three presentations will run first, and then we will have a Q&A discussion with the panel members. If you want your question to be included, please make sure you, you put it in the Q&A, not the chat. And now to our first speaker, Nigel. Okay, let's get into it. Retrofitting homes is one of the most fundamental and difficult things to do in many regards in a bushfire prone area. Do we have half a million homes? Do we have one million homes that are actually high or extreme bushfire prone in Australia? Different people have different figures, but certainly the uh, middle of last year, the Royal Commission was told it could be anywhere between 400,000 and a million existing homes for which there is little or no protection at present. So frankly, it's a bigger, more fundamental issue than it is for building new, because with new homes for the last 25 years, there's been increasingly stringent building regulations. So we're at the start of what to do when we have one of the 9.9 .9 million existing homes in Australia, how can we make it more resilient more likely to survive a bushfire. I won't go into this, but particularly if you've been listening to this series, you'll understand that burning embers is the biggest risk because 80 to 90% of house losses come from burning embers that can be hundreds of meters, even kilometers away from the main fire front. So number one, look at anything and everything to do with your house. How could embers potentially ignite? Radiant heat, a key issue, because as the fire gets closer, obviously the heat intensity is much more. And our bodies can take very little heat for only often a few seconds or half a minute. So we need protection just as our houses need protection. Direct flame, that occurs if and when you're on top of a slope or the fire and lots of vegetation or even adjacent house is a flame and the flame is actually hitting the building materials of your, your property. Two other points, obviously fires generate their own extreme winds and of course smoke. So smoke damage to houses can be ongoing and of course smoke damage to people as well as all the other aspects to do with, with homes. So 
you need to understand what is the most likely bushfire direction in relationship to your home. What is going to most likely ignite? Is it, is it trees, vegetation, garden, vegetation up close? Is it embers coming over the neighbor's house, neighbor's fence? What is it? Number one, consider that. But then you've got to look at things that can ignite and burn because there's a long proven history of even things like a doormat setting a whole house on fire when the place has been evacuated. So look, timber decks, obviously, Timber decks are crucial, very easy to ignite. Steps close to ground level, furniture. The bottom right on the screen shows, you know, a timber deck. It shows highly flammable um, uh, furniture and a timber house. So that it would only take a spark or two in the wrong place or a burning ember to set that off. And within a few minutes, it would be totally unstoppable. Fences, garden mulch. If you listen to last night's discussion, there was that point that timber mulch, of course, can carry a fire right up to your property, right up to your house. So part of the advice last night was minimize it, don't use it, perhaps use gravel or some other way or pathways, paving around close to your house. Because one of the other fundamentals is that during a fire driven by strong winds, it is the lowest portion that often is at greatest risk, where the leaves, where the burning embers collect. Horizontally, that could be the ground level, it could be at the deck, it could be a timber windowsill. We have to look carefully at all of those and look again at what can we do about it. If we've got timber retaining walls, for example, they are toxic when they burn, as well as they can burn for hours. And there's many a house that have unfortunately burned down when the retaining wall in timber has burned for hours and that flame and that heat has ignited the house and very quickly became unstoppable. So if you have existing retaining walls, you might want to cover them with something non-combustible, just like I'll talk about shortly when I'm talking about walls. Certainly though, even simple things like fences, there's been testing of 20 different kinds of fences, and it's proven that some of the most flammable is, of course, the treated pine. Again, toxic, toxic smoke, toxic ash. On the top right is actually my old house, very close to neighbor. So unfortunately, there is a timber fence there that I covered on my side, being a good architect, with secondhand corrugated metal. I like the aesthetics, and it's to minimize flame and heat should there be a house to house fire. Seal the building, because as I said, it's the burning embers that might be literally a, a tiny bit of branch, a bit of burning bark that's traveled kilometers in the wind. It could be a leaf or two, and it gets in perhaps in the weep hole, bottom left, the necessary ventilation that you get under brick homes. It could be the elevated timber deck. So you need to look at how to close these off. We see the brickwork example. You, you can buy special little devices to fit in, but more simply, you could use metal, preferably stainless steel, ordinary flywire mesh, just cut it to size, bend it over and push it in because you still want that ventilation under floor, but you certainly don't want the sparks and embers to get under the floor, fester away, get the floor alight before you even know the fire is there. Same with your roofing. You can see bottom right where somebody has gone to the trouble of just cutting to suit. There's not much option these days in getting them pre-made. There's one minor company that does it, but it's not really available. I wish there was more. I've been trying to get them for the last few years to do so. In the middle, you can see how on my own house again, old house, um, I used some mesh to, and I trimmed the mesh. This was mesh normally used to close off gutters. But here again, I got out the metal snips to get the closer um, profile because I was still trying to allow the roof ventilation, which is important. I'm in a cold climate, Blue Mountains. You must get your ventilation in the roof, but you don't want the embers. So. You close off gaps and cracks. And of course, part of that, you can see top right how leaves and 
um, embers could get into a typical gutter. The jury is actually out about how effective gutter guard may be, metal gutter guards. The argument goes that um, it stops the uh, all the debris getting down low because if that catches a light, the flame is then starting to go under the roof sheeting, even though it's metal sheeting. So the evidence is not clear, but still in many cases, it's considered desirable. And certainly you don't want to have a, a roof with that kind of debris remotely through the fire season. So in all these matters, maintenance and vigilance is pretty fundamental, do it. Now, all materials, incredibly difficult to cover in a couple of minutes because Australian Standard 3959, construction of buildings in bushfire prone areas, has 60 or 80 pages going through the different bowel levels, bushfire attack level, from bowel 12 and a half through to flame zone. And it keeps up, upping the requirements of what the materials have to resist fire. So effectively, they start off at bowel 12 and a half and nearly all common building materials are okay. And then if you go up the, the grades, lesser materials are listed as being acceptable. So new houses have to conform. And the irony is that additions to existing houses have to conform, but depending which state or territory you're in, you may or may not have to upgrade the house as a whole. So the photograph bottom right is a project of a couple of years ago that came to me, 25, 30 years old, all timber, as you can see. And everything that would catch burning embers and maximize the heat, radiant heat, and it's flame zone. So these people came to me a couple of years ago, how can we add a bathroom? And of course, the argument is, hmm, not easily. Because in New South Wales, where I am, the addition has to be meeting flame zone, even though the house as a whole has next to no chance of survival. So to use the jargon, pimple on a pumpkin. The new bit had to be entirely non-combustible and they ignored the rest of the house. So if you ask me, what would I do with that house if I wasn't engaged just to look at doing a small addition, I would say, well, the timber is good for energy efficiency, for the material use, for the low embodied energy, but I would be looking at coating, covering that existing timber work, probably with corrugated metal over, corrugated color bond, over a bit more insulation. And I would certainly on the fire side, typically three sides, you kind of know which direction the fire is likely to come in most cases. If they had a spare 10,000, that's what I would be doing. I would be removing the timber linings wherever I could externally and replacing everything non-combustible of key fundamental issue. Anyway, generally non-combustible, obviously brick, concrete block, blocks generally, stone, earth, they're all approved across virtually all bowel levels from the minor bushfire risk through to the extreme of flame zone. Hardwoods, they all have known fire resisting properties. At the back of standard 3959, there is a list of the different species and at different bowel ratings, which ones you may use, Australian hardwoods in particular, but there are six or seven, which are, if you like, the standouts amongst uh, the timbers available, and you can use them fairly extensively, certainly to bowel 29, and in some cases, bowel 40. So to be clear on that, you need to look at the, what's called bushfire resisting timbers, if you're looking at it through Australian standard 3959, it's those two appendices. Otherwise, to retrofit, color bond sheeting, I use it quite frequently because obviously it's non-combustible, it's relatively inexpensive, it's easily fixed, and you can fix it under your deck. You can fix it on a wall. You can fix it around the dormer windows, all the, the vulnerable areas where the embers will catch. It's easy and relatively low cost, and most homeowners with any handyman skills can do it equally. So color bond sheeting, good, good choice. 
just bear in mind that if you're going putting in a deck down to ground level to basically put a non-combustible skirt around it, you still need to allow ventilation. So maybe a little bit of stainless steel fly screen mesh here and there to keep the embers out. Certainly the Australian standard says aperture less than two millimeters. So by happy chance and coincidence, you'll find most fly screens in, of the metal variety, the aperture is 1.8 millimeters or 1.9. So they are very useful to cover. Even simple things like the, the plastic ventilator, ventilator from a um, bathroom exhaust or a kitchen exhaust. You need to be consistent in trying to really wrap the whole building in less combustible materials. Fibre cement is approved. They generally want six millimetre or more as you go up the bow levels. Certainly what had been normal, the, the four and a half millimetre quarter inch, forget it. If you've got six millimetre or more, you're going to get safer. And bear in mind that there are also several grades in that the denser version made by the major manufacturers is going to be far better than the old, old style of fibro uh, with or without the old asbestos cement uh, sheeting. So you can use them, but the thicker, the better, and the denser version is definitely best. The other product's been around for now five or eight years on the Australian market, uh, magnesium oxide board or sheet. The biggest brand name was called Inex. They went to the wall in Australia some years ago because every product has upsides and downsides. And the downside of magnesium oxide was that it was highly alkaline. And they found that using standard screws, were, it was stripping the metal protection on the screw. And unfortunately, the boards start to fall off walls. Key problem. So now you can use magnesium oxide, it's highly effective. Um, there are companies like Fire Crunch uh, that do it, but you have to use stainless steel screws, you pre-drill. So just be conscious again on all of these materials. They all have their place, but you need to be cautious where you use them and how you fix them. Glazing is often the weak link, apart from after gaps and cracks, because old glass, standard glass, cracks very readily from heat. And of course, then with the winds, or if there's any flying branches, they fall out and then the fire might uh, commence inside the home, curtains, furnishings, whatever. So shutters are very effective. Now you can see top right, a retrofit on actually an earth brick building. They had a circular window, but they really wanted to be safe. So they had the head box, as you can see, and the shutter that comes down. Key difficulty with all of these shutters, they're always square or rectangular. So if you've got triangular windows, round windows, you've got to either accept, certainly with round windows, you've squared it off, what a pity. If it's triangular windows, you could actually look at having a sheet metal one made that swings or falls down or has something to hold it up. Whatever way you do it, it's got to be close fitting, no more than two millimeters. Fingers crossed, you can get it closed when the fire comes through. Key issue, might be open, might be closed. So play safe. The top right, these days, aluminum shutters are not deemed good enough because the aluminum starts to soften and melt at 550 degrees. And a real fire can be a thousand degrees or even as much as 1700 degrees that they found in the 2009 Victorian fires. So no aluminium anymore. It's got to be stainless steel. There's only one, one importer that I know with several distributors, stainless steel, but it looks the same, but that's what it is. Bottom right shows one of the two Australian Sydney manufacturers that I know of, no, three now, that uses a very fine stainless steel mesh. The advantage is the head box is very small. You can hide it quite often in, in your eave. The disadvantage is that it doesn't help you for security 
you wouldn't leave it down all day every day through summer because of the intensity of Australian sun and sunlight. So it is absolutely an emergency product to bring down when you need it. On the center left shows a very nice architect designed house, which had, as you can see, they eliminated the gutter because they weren't that keen on collecting water, although they did. Water runs straight off and you'll see there's a strip drain running up and down, but it'll still splash around as well. But in the triangle a bit, they've got conventional uh, shutters that you can see are nicely hidden in that angle and they come down straight over the glass. So that's another more sophisticated way of dealing with it. Now, generally, glazing should be toughened glass. It required safety glass if it's close to the floor or next to a, uh, a door, but the whole process of toughening glass, they heat, heat it, superheat it and quench it. It changes the micro crystalline structure. So what that means is that it's very hard to break, good for security, but the fact that it's been heated to 12 or 1300 degrees already means that the fire front coming through is not likely to cause that glass to fail. But again, think of what the frame is. If it's a timber frame, that could ignite, in which case it's not necessarily helping you. If you're replacing glass, yep, toughen glass, it can be in double glazing. So that's great. But obviously that's an expensive retrofit. So if you're going to do that, make sure you go for energy efficiency as well as tough and glass. There are so many choices there now. Get expert advice from your supplier or a designer, whoever. Nigel. Uh, yes, finish. Are, are you, um, how about one more minute? Yep, okay. Stainless okay. steel mesh, very effective, not, not helpful when it comes to regulations, but it does do a lot of trick. Last slide, whole house protection, sprinklers, fire hose reels. Only trouble is they need maintenance and you or me, whoever, they need to know how to operate it because so often they failed at the last minute because no one's tested it for too long, et cetera, et cetera. So look, that's about it for me. Um, there's obviously lots to talk about and Paul is going to talk about something very interesting uh, before we get Alan talking more about the energy efficiency side. So thank you very much. Sorry about the initial delay up front. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to try and share my screen. How are we looking? Can we see that? Yes, looking fine. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my name is Paul Dolphin. I am an accredited building designer and I live in um, Malo Bay, New South Wales. Um, I'm the Managing Director of PDD Building Design. We're a team of um, sustainable and award-winning building designers. Um, we did go through the recent uh, bushfire events. Um, we were lucky enough that our house survived and our office survived, although many of our um, friends and clients weren't so lucky. And what I would say is that um, none of us came out of it, you know, without um, some feeling some effects. Um, our work is very similar to that of an architect. We do bespoke designs. Uh, most of our work is sustainable design when we can. Uh, I would say that 80% of our work is in bushfire prone areas. And I'd say 50-50 in terms of retrofitting and uh, new builds. Okay, so I'm just going to cover my story, um, which is going to feed in a little bit on landscaping. And then I want to talk about how sustainable technologies can be resilient. And then we're just going to look at, um, we're going to take um, the previous presentation there and just look a little bit broader on, on some of those issues and um, just things that strategically you might want to consider um, that might impact how resilient our retrofits can be. Then just bring it to a close. Okay. Um, my story, I'm uh, from the UK. I moved out to Australia eight years ago. And my um, ambition was to design 
and have built a house by the time I was 40. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking he doesn't look a day over 30. That's very kind. Sadly, I'm over 40 now. Uh, but on the good side, we did manage to have our house designed and built We uh, by the time I was 40. And we completed it in April 2017. Two weeks later, a bushfire roared over the hill. Um, and being from the UK, it was my first experience of a bushfire. I was actually quoting a job around the corner and there was ash falling on me. I had friends calling me saying, get out of there. And um, I went back to the house and I um, got my old passports and the kids' teddies. I remember closing the door and thinking I'd never see the place again. And I suppose this house for me was, it's a little bit like uh, a debut album, really. You know, we put 40 years of thoughts and stuff that we've collected from Swedish um, furniture to German Bauhaus lamps, you know, and we, we, I really thought it wasn't going to be there. Well, we, it did survive that fire. And what it informed us was a couple of things, really. The first thing was I called my insurance company and made sure that my insurance was up to date. But then it really informed us how we dealt with the, the landscape design. As you can see from this photograph, um, Manila Bay is lots of hills. So we had to do a big cut and fill. And uh, we were left with a quarter acre of Malua Bay clay, just dirt. So it was serendipitous timing, that fire. That fire, I should say, didn't. we didn't lose any buildings. We didn't harm anyone. Um, and it, it, it led us to think about our landscaping. Now, I know this was touched on quite a lot last night, so we're only going to go on over it briefly. But this landscaping for bushfire is a, a really useful document. And it's really important to think about your APZ, your asset protection zone, and have that as a defensible area. And you can do that with low combustible plants and landscaping. I think a really important point here, though, is that we often, um, we often think that we should be, um, it's green and sustainable to use low water species. And there is a big drive in Australia to use native vegetation because of the sensitivity of our uh, native biodiversity. Both those are valid and, and very applicable. And um, we have low water species and a low water design garden. However, with planning for bushfire protection, you know, non-native vegetation has a role to play. Um, we, uh, uh, non-native vegetation doesn't burn, often doesn't burn in the same way that native vegetation do does, you know, of over millions of years of evolution. And this is a really, really good image uh, from the recent fires. And it's uh, a mulberry tree in Brogo Forest. And the owner of this house um, spent weeks, spent October, November and December watering this tree because he knew the, the fire was coming, as we all did. And um, he credits that tree with saving his house. And I think it's a really, really iconic image that shows just how, uh, you know, interestingly, how close that tree is to his house and yet how it actually protected his house because it didn't burn. Going back to our landscaping then, you can see from this photograph, this is taken from a slightly different angle from the other one. This is actually about two months after the bushfire came through. And those trees, um, they don't actually look it in that photograph, but they were all burnt. So the fire actually burnt around our house there. And you can see some key examples of landscape design there. We've got pebbles up against the house, non-combustible. We've got a metal shade structure, so that's non-combustible. We've got concrete paving. Um, we've got core 10 edging. And we've got, uh, you know, low flammable planting. And that's just another image there. Um, again, you've got um, low uh, combustible um, veg beds. Okay, another thing that um, I want to talk about that came out of our experience of the fires is that susp sustainability can equal resilience. So, you know, we often weigh up sustainable options against economic paybacks. How long are these solar panels going to take me to pay back? Is it five years, 10 years? Should I buy a battery? Is it cost effective? You know, we often analyze things like that, but we don't analyze things like 
concrete bench tops or marble bench tops or fancy baths or fancy vanities. We just buy those because they're nice. We budget them in. So it's strange that we do that just for sustainable technology. And I suppose the key thing is to remember that sustainable technology is not just about economic sustainability. It can also be about sustainable technology. So, you know, remember there can be benefits for resilience in bush hire for sustainable technologies. The key statistic that I always pull out um, is that more people die from excess cold in their homes in Australia than they do in Sweden. Okay, that's a phenomenal statistic. So if we can design or retrofit houses or new houses to be solar passive, to be more habitable, you know, that is like, I don't know how we can put an economic um, value on not dying. You know, like it's it's crucial. So when we look at that, you know, in terms of the bushfire, well, we were we were waiting for the bushfire to come for two or three months. We were recovering from the bushfire for two or three months. The landscape around us was burning for six weeks, you know, but the actual fire itself just ran past us in, in 30 minutes or an hour. So, you know, our house is solar passive. We had a habitable place to shelter, to wait out the extreme heat events without having to heat or cool it, you know, without having to run air conditioning when there was no power. The other thing to consider as well is our house is grid connected with six kilowatts of solar PV and a seven kilowatt battery. Now the battery has an emergency power supply, an EPS. So we had six weeks of intermittent power. We had days and days where there was no power. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I'm sure there are other people listening who went through exactly the same experience. Our EPS kicked in and gave us lights to put the kids to bed at night. It gave us power to charge our phones and it kept our fridge running. There were people throwing away thousands of dollars worth of food repeatedly over that period. There were people going out panic buying diesel generators, which they're only going to run for those four weeks. They're going to sit in the garage for 10 years and the next event, they're going to pull them out and they won't have been serviced and they won't work. You know, if you're thinking about buying a diesel generator, you can chuck $2,000 at a, a, a solar system and a battery. You know, it left us relatively comfortable for those six weeks. You know, we had cold milk for tea during the day. And when we got bored of the tea, we had cold beer at night, which are basically two crucial ingredients for sitting out a catastrophic fire event. Um, just key issues that can reduce bush fire resilience when retrofitting. Having just said in my previous slide that, you know, we shouldn't base everything on, um, economics and there are other advantages and Nigel's you know touched on this previously um it can be too expensive to retrofit or you know you're not going to see that benefit back you know I just ripped this picture off um off the internet you know it, if we had to replace all this cladding if we have to replace the deck if we have to fill in the deck you know what is where are we going to be left economically you're going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars in you know, is it just too expensive? And then the other thing to consider is, um, you know, what is out of your control? Where are your boundaries in relation to the house? And critically, will your APZ be large enough? So in theory, as long as your asset protection zone is large enough to keep the radiant heat from any fire away from you, as long as your asset protection zone is adequately managed and your house is ember proof, in theory, it should survive. But for example, if your house is too close to a neighbor's boundary, that neighbor's boundary has itself got a badly designed house on there that's not up to standard, or it's up against some vegetation that you can't manage, then if you can't control your APZ, it doesn't matter how much ember protection we do, that is out of your, out of your control. And I suppose it's the same with relationship to slopes and topography. You know, if you have a large upslope that is out of your control, you can't manage it, just by the very nature of fire and topography, 
that's going to impact you. So I suppose those things are things that you might consider perhaps, you know, at the early stages of looking at retrofitting, you know, it is the, are these things so far out of your control, it's actually prohibitive to do these projects really. And then the final thing is, um, you know, is it going to be difficult or expensive to clear native vegetation that is on your land? The biodiversity offset scheme is a, uh, a, a, a rabbit warren of, um, of sorry a rabbit hole of uh, incredible complexity suffice to say you know if you seek to take some trees down it can cost you tens hundreds up to some millions of dollars to clear small areas of trees so you just need to be mindful of if you're going to be required to remove trees to maintain the apz what is going to be involved in terms of biodiversity legislation. I should add, some of that is only New South Wales specific. People from other states will have other, other um, legislation that affects them. Okay, so that's me um, all done. So just to conclude, you know, landscape design is key. And, you know, consider what is in your control and out of your control. You know, consider what's cost effective before you start anything and also really this is really key and this is going to talk this is going to be raised i'm sure you know in, in depth in the next presentation um there are great advantages to having good thermal performance in terms of you being able to um survive through extreme weather events and you know having power backups in emergency situations is is really fundamental if you've got any questions we're going to be answering questions later and also i think i'm going to be involved in the speed data designer later on in july if you if you want any more direct questions wonderful thank you i'm now going to uh hand you over to um to alan who's going to do the next one Right. Share the screen. I've just unmuted myself. Right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, just getting my act into gear here. Right. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to disappoint Paul, unfortunately, because I'm going to be talking about appliances in my very short presentation tonight. Um, so that's, uh, uh, we can cover buildings later, if you like, in sessions. Why am I talking about appliances? Well, as we move towards a renewable energy future, the reality is we're dealing with uh, very variable energy sources. Uh, so solar is great, but not on a cloudy day and not in winter. Uh, so we need to think about what we are using energy for and how we can adapt our energy requirements to um, the, the situation we have. So let's think about um, when we are looking at appliances, we're looking at quite long-term investments. So what are the kinds of issues that we need to think about when we're making those investments? Um, obviously climate change, not just extreme heat, extreme wind, extreme rain and erosion events. We're going to see all of our infrastructure systems stressed more often and probably uh, for either very short or maybe long periods of time, we might have to do without major infrastructure, as Paul talked about. Uh, future energy prices, particularly in rural areas, are quite uncertain. But on the positive side, um, changing energy market rules and the emerging business models and technologies mean that we've got uh, increasing opportunities for lots of fantastic alternatives such as going off grid, micro grids, community batteries, plugging your electric vehicle into your home, all these kinds of things are transforming our possibilities. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing big cost reductions and enhanced capabilities among appliances, energy storage, local renewable generation, and all those kinds of things. Also, it's worth keeping in mind, if you are rebuilding after a fire and you have to take out a mortgage, 
that is a very good time to package your investments in all of your high efficiency appliances uh, into that loan because that will maximise your disposable income in the short to medium term. And at today's interest rates, it's a pretty good bargain, really. Uh, if we think about the features of the appliances that we might want, well, the first one is energy efficiency. And the graph there just shows for a, a hypothetical, typical all electric house, um, the sort of amounts of energy that were being used by the typical appliances in 2014 and 2019. Uh, we've seen some improvement, but then you can see if you invested in the best appliances now, you could have much lower energy use than you would have uh, with the existing averages. Also, you need to think about the demand of your electricity, uh, of your appliances. Um, this slide just shows you the big contributors at the system peak. Uh, so you can see heating and cooling in winter, lighting, uh, appliances all year, uh, cooking um, and hot water can be big issues. So you need to think about the peak demand because that peak demand is gonna relate to your inverter capacity and your uh, size of your renewable systems. Um, likewise, flexibility is really important. Um, and so a good example here is that if you look at a heat pump hot water service, it can be used, uh, you can run it when you want, and its peak demand is only about a kilowatt compared with a resistive heating element, even in a solar hot water service in winter, uh, might be pulling two and a half or three and a half kilowatts. So think about flexibility. There's a pretty strong trend towards electric solutions, not gas, um, obviously wood, and into the future, maybe, you know, bioenergy generation, uh, and modular relocatable energy systems uh, will play an increasing role. It's all a bit unclear really, but you know, there's possibilities there. We need information and the appliance energy label is a really important thing. And you can see there's a long list of products that now have energy labels. Yeah, there are a few traps though. First of all, for quite a few products like TVs, clothes dryers, pool pumps, air conditioners, the best products now have more than six stars, which is the maximum on the old uh, rating scheme uh, label. And the trouble is that the extra, what they call coronet of extra stars up to a maximum of 10 stars only appears once you are over six stars. So if you go into a showroom, there may be no seven or eight star products on display, but they exist. Also check the consumption number, not just the star rating because the star ratings are related to the size or the capacity of the product. And keep in mind that the rating scales have changed over time. So for example, if you've got a 1990s fridge that says five stars, uh, sorry, that's only one and a half stars on today's scale. So you wanna keep that in mind. Also, we are phasing in a new reverse cycle air conditioning label, which will have separate climate zones. So you'll be able to select products that are better suited to your uh, climate zone. Information is really important. And uh, Victorian homes now have what are called smart meters. They're sort of dumb smart meters, but they're useful. Uh, and most people with solar systems have got pretty good data and data analytics. And so energy retailers uh, uh, and your solar systems are able to show you what's going on when. And this is very important because this means you can learn from your experience from your existing home about what's using a lot of power and when. And so that can help you, first of all, identify problems you might have that you didn't know about, but also it can help you when you're thinking about your investments in the future. And there's increasing range of products around. Uh, I don't have time to talk much about heat pumps, but I find it interesting. Most people just have no idea how a heat pump can work. Um, I compare uh, the compressor of a heat pump to a bike pump. Um, as I pump up my bike tires, what I notice is that the pump and the air get hot. And that's basically what the electric motor driving the compressor is doing. It's taking a low pressure gas 
and compressing it and it gets hot. That gives you useful heat. And then as the refrigerant flows back through a valve, it uh, absorbs heat from somewhere else. So a heat pump can heat and cool. That's the basic idea. The other thing is that a lot of people say uh, heat pumps can't work in cold weather. Uh, the laws of thermodynamics operate from a base temperature of outer space, that is minus 273 degrees Celsius. So in fact, what we experience as cold air is actually pretty hot. And that's why heat pumps work in Germany and China and uh, Japan and a whole lot of places where it is quite cold. Also, of course, the thing is that a heat pump is not creating heat. And that's why it can have an efficiency of 500% because it's not making heat. It is extracting heat from one place, concentrating it and delivering it somewhere else. My last slide is about caravans because I've been looking at these a bit recently and there's lots of issues here. First of all, most of them have little or no insulation and even the new ones don't have much insulation and their fridges are shockers. If you've got an LPG three-way fridge and you run that fridge on electricity, it will use enormous amounts of electricity because it's actually not running an efficient compressor. It's heating an element to provide the heat that the LPG flame used to provide. So caravans are certainly uh, quite a concern to me and we need to do a lot more work on managing them. Um, but we can, and I think with modern technologies such as induction cooking and high efficiency equipment, we can, uh, we can have caravans that work. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Oops, stop sharing. Right, okay, there we go. Thank you, Alan. Thank you all. Now, if you, if you can, um, Paul and Nigel, um, come back on and we'll start looking at uh, the questions. All right. So thanks for your presentations, folks. Um, the first question I'll, I'll share is from Robert. He says, I would like to ask about gutter guards and snow. We have, have bought some to install to combat, combat ember attack. Um, a leaf stopper, but have not put them up yet. Yesterday we had about five centimeters of snow, which was enough to bend the gutter, particularly where the snow slid off the solar panels, putting 30 centimeters of snow on the edge of the roof and on the gutter. My question is, can gutter guards also help protect gutters against snow damage? Who would like, uh, Nigel, I can see it. you. Now <laughs> it's snowing outside where I live. <laughs> okay. Short answer, no because it's the sheer weight of snow, and of course that compacts over time. Obviously it's sitting on top of the gutter, not in the gutter, but the, it might slightly redistribute the weight because the way the gutter guard is attached to the roof itself, but it's not an answer. Okay, there you go, Robert. Uh, Brian asks, is there any way to seal gaps in tiled roofs? Is that no. for that one? Nigel, no. <laughs> because, I mean, look, tiles are not sensible, I suggest, in higher extreme bushfire areas. Think about it. You've got probably thousands of individual items that unless each and every one is tied down, which never normally happens, they move with the wind. Often, particularly the older houses, all had timber battens. So with that moving, embers coming in underneath, captured, between the sarking, which I hope you have, and the timber, absolutely no. They're still there purely because of the industry pressure and the fact they've been part of the Australian vernacular for so long. But no, I don't use them. I don't recommend them anything personally, medium to high bushfire risk. Save it for when you're well away from fire risk. Yep. Can I add to that? You know, uh, a lot of them are, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s houses. Um, a, a concrete tiled roof would have a remaining life of around 30 to 40 years. 
So, you know, if you're looking at retrofitting, you know, you could argue if it's come to the end of its life, then that's a good time. It's a double double, double argument for um, replacing it. Good point. So what you're saying, to just be clear about that, a concrete, concrete tile has a life expectancy of around 30 to 40 years. Yeah. Now that's, that's an average. So like you can't, you know, people go, yeah, but mine's lasted this long, but realistically you, you're going to have to start doing increasing maintenance. The tiles will crack. The tiles will be porous, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you could look at replacing with a color bond roof and you could double justify it really. You could also, you know, you could probably triple justify it because it's always an opportunity to get some socking in under there and another layer of insulation, which was never put in in the yeah. first place. Yeah, you know, exactly. so you probably got bushfire resilience replacing an old thing. It's probably going to be more waterproof and it'll be uh, a lot warmer. Now, now you're up to four. <laughs> four, yeah, I'll keep going. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. I like that. Um, okay, Fraser says our forty-year-old house on a steep slope was burnt in twenty fifteen fires. We have a new house, Bell Forty, steep slope, high landslip risk, etc. Five-year struggle. Post fire were post fire were addressed at several meetings by Delp and fire mapping experts. It was explained that the houses burnt one after the other as each spread to the next. Even some bell rated houses burnt next to older houses. This caused consternation in the community. If I build to a bell standard and next door's old house has no compliance or requirement to retrofit, then that exposes me. Any suggestions to deal with this? And that is a situation in, well, in our town where three, five, th three or four houses were burnt and then one or two were, are still there. And you know, it's, mm, yes. Um, oh. Oh, well, all I was going to say is, you know, I suppose that speaks to the my presentation when I was talking about things out of your control. It may be the case that, like, if you're choosing to live somewhere or you're choosing to move, you know, that might be one of the things you consider really? at that early stage. You know, look around, look at what your neighbor's houses are built of. That doesn't answer if you're rebuilding or retrofitting. And, and a house that you've already got. So I'll hand over yeah. to Nigel. Alan. Yeah, Alan, yes. Yeah. Just to reinforce Nigel's comment of earlier, um, looking, he, he clad his timber fence next door with, with uh, corrugated iron. Um, people I know who were in Canberra when uh, bushfires went through some suburbs, um, the main problem was in fact, the timber fences acted as wicks and set fire to the vegetation that then happen to have flames go up under the eaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can I add to that, that there's the Canberra fires 2003, 2004, that got people aware that as they evacuated suburbs, embers ignited houses three or 500 metres away from the edge of the suburb, <laughs> and then fire, house to house fires took over because mm -hmm. there was no one there. The, the emergency services can't look after every house. Every house was on its own, and that's where you got the maximum losses. So one of the fundamental equations now is you save life by evacuation, but you lose more properties. So again, it comes back to families, couples, whoever, taking greater personal responsibility to retrofit and to try and make your house safe under your particular circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, yes, I could go in, into great detail there, um, uh, but I'll stick with a question. Agar V say, asks, uh, does hempcrete meet in any, any of the bell rating requirements? No is the short answer because unfortunately the palette of materials that have been fire tested is obviously representing all the major industry players. It's a fundamental problem that new and innovative products, however fantastic they are, usually the, the entrepreneurs don't have that spare 50 or 100,000 to do multiple fire tests to get it over the line, no matter how good it is. This is uh, unfortunate byproduct of trying to get greater fire safety. In the normal course of events, we are being limited to major industry made components. 
There is an so, alternative solution rarely used every day. Mm. I, I, I see Paul wanting to say something. I also yeah. want to put in, okay, you go ahead, Paul. Oh, well, what I was going to say is actually there is, if you're, if you're interested in those sorts of an alternative material, there's this stuff, which is um, the Natural Brick Company, which is um, bricks made from recycled uh, timber pallets uses the aggregate instead of stone. They are based near you, Nigel, somewhere around your area. More and they, ha they have done the testing um, and they are way, way above uh, flame zone requirements with this material. It's a really good material. And mm -hmm. we have been specifying this for numerous of our rebuilds. So it's the natural brick company. And I'm, I think that's quite a good uh, solution. I agree. And I'm not being, I'm not, I don't get any kickbacks for saying that. <laughs> I agree. That but the classic problem was when I, I've been using it since they started, that the 190 millimeter thick block has four hours of fire resistance. The AS3959 says if it's a masonry product, as this is, it must be 90. And we had an absolute impossible situation where we wanted to use their cladding panel which varied between 70 and 90 millimeters attached to foam to super insulate, not allowed to use it. Because again, unless that tick thickness is tested, yeah. it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So again, it's unfortunately, we have a very conservative regime, which is onerous and it's inhibiting change. It's really inhibiting innovation, isn't it? Um, so the, the opportunity- No easy way out. Right, oh gosh. In, in um, the old days, we used to have uh, CSIRO and company organizations like that with the independent testing facilities. Yeah. Now it's money making, money making. CSIRO don't do it like they used to. Yeah, exactly. They also want to be paid and it's typically $20,000 for the test, not counting the modeling. And then often there is multiple iterations. So at least 50, sometimes 80 or 100,000. You'd think that some of the insurance um, companies would be very interested in, in having some of this, this testing themselves. But anyway, I'll move on. Um, good question though. Um, John, hi, I live against Jarvis Bay National Park, brick two-story, whoops, it went away. Uh, brick two-story tile roof. I think we would be a bell 40, I'm guessing. And I blanket system put over my window and garage door to stop radiant heat and flame and will it be sufficient? Short so, answer, it will help. It, it will help. It won't meet any regulations but so much of the retrofit is not about regulation it's about doing yeah. the best you can in your circumstance. So mm -hmm. yes I mean reflective foils uh, let alone the specialized more expensive foil to cover all the glazing as well as all the other um, susceptible areas will certainly help. It'll, it'll make a difference. Great. Paul, anything? Well, I'd agree with that, yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Um, Anonymous asks, uh, I have an open treated pine deck with no enclosed spa space underneath and no vegetation underneath. I've looked at various decking alternatives, but I doubt that the support structure has been designed to carry anything much heavier. I have considered flame retardant plants, but I'm unsure about these. Just wondering what the best option may be to reduce the fire risk. Many thanks. So where would you go? Timber deck. Oh, what I, say? Oh, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that sort of flame retardant paints can have a benefit. Um, how beneficial they are mm. um, depends on you, depends on the circumstances, I suppose. Right. And maintenance. Yes. Mm, yeah, maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and maintenance. That's something yeah. that was mentioned last night over and over. Sure. Yeah, I suppose you know if you if you're going to be painting that on top of the deck and then walking on it every day, that's a different type of paint again, isn't it? You know, that's a traffic paint you need. Yeah. Well, technically, the term is intumescent. That is paints and finishes that uh, you put on as a liquid. It becomes solid as it dries, and then at a certain heat point foams up to become uh, basically a, a sticky liquid. And that's the point of stopping the substrate burning. But in situations like this, um, I would always be looking at, can we put 
a non-combustible skirt around the underside, still allowing a bit of ventilation. That would be the first thing I'd do, quite apart from keeping sure the vegetation is not up close. And then, of course, there are products where you could replace the timber decking. I mean, hardwood is better than softwood or treated pine. There's modwood, which is a recycled, repurposed, um, uh, reconstituted product, and they, that's up to barrel 40. And there's also then James Hardy makes their hardy deck, which is basically broad, wide planks of fiber cement, which can meet flame zone. So you do have options. Uh, again, start with the simple, depending on your budget, and then move up the scale to do better if you can afford it. Right. Um, thanks, Nigel. Francis says, uh, I'm specifically interested in a high set home. I can see that closing it all in would do the trick, but what about some type of fireproof board below the exposed floor? So yeah, you, um, yeah, you do something like that. There's actually, there's um, a quite famous image now of a, a bow 40 house that, um, survived the bushfires in Rosedale and that's off the floor and it's not um it's not enclosed you know um so yeah you could you could just you could look at some kind of board beneath it just the thing to consider is you know fire does come up and under and I think again you'd have to get below the two millimeter and one of the speakers previously and a previous night had, had uh, discussed um that you have to consider it as expensive as doing a wall of that same size. So there's quite a cost in, in putting yeah. that in. Is that... Nine to add, it depends entirely what are the support, because obviously they need to be entirely non-combustible. And then the other key thing is what about the plumbing and the drainage and the things that typically come through? Because again, if it's a normal UPVC plastic, as I'm not sure 99% of uh, project homes or homes are, then that's the first thing to melt away, and in which case the fire gets through your fire resistant board into the flooring structure. So mm. by all means, you can do it, but like all these things, you've got to be 100% conscious of what, where the weak spot is and make sure you eliminate it. Right. Um, which is relevant for the next one. Window framing suggestions for fire zones. Well, they're depending on what your bell rating is, 3959 local government regulations will tell you. Obviously, um, metal is inherently uh, for fire is less prone. You can use UPVC, which actually has a metal frame underneath, typically up mm -hmm. to bell 29. You can use most hardwoods in framing to bell 29. Some can go to bell 40. And there's one Australian brand that can go to flame zone. But again, certainly in New South Wales, the frustration is the permission is for windows and they're silent on using the same timber, same everything when it comes to doors. They, so you're left, like too many of these matters, you're left in who is certifying it, who's ticking the boxes. And unfortunately, there is a wide variety of therefore of what is available and what, who accepts what fundamental industry problem. Right, right. Um, Ina, or Ina say, asks, are fire retardant trees acceptable in the APZ or APZ? There's no right. real fire retardant trees. If you mm -hmm. listen to last night, you heard the comments about fire wise planting and that very excellent uh, resource that Paul showed you the title of which is available online free it goes into 12 different characteristics of plants that assist in fire resistance i just wish there was a comparable document for each state and territory in australia because the victorian one is excellent but of course they're referring to climates and plants and ecologies specific to victoria but the principles are excellent and very well well considered Okay, thanks. Uh, another person asks, um, I have a timber clad steel pole house on a sloping block with an open elevated wooden deck. There are significant tree and landscape risks. 
what option would you recommend? Where do you start? Should I enclose below the deck? If so, is an insulated slab with Hebel walls a good choice for protection and sustainability? Or replace wooden deck, replace the timber cladding, steel shutters? Where do you begin? Basically, by a close site examination, which we can't do via this webinar. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> sign up. Sign up for the speed data designer night, and you know, you might get some free yeah. advice there. I guess you know, it's um, there's a lot in that question, hmm. um, and and there's a lot of outcomes. It's dependent on budget. It's dependent on the proximity of the vegetation slope. Can any of the vegetation be removed? You know, if you're enclosing below the deck, do you? want to use that space for something you know is there a benefit to that so yeah nigel's right there's uh um yeah the science or can or sign up. yeah that's a good a good um recommendation for getting involved in the sustainable or the um, speed dating which we'll discuss in a few minutes um liz asked paul you have cement sheet walls what have you joined them with so they're just, yeah, flat FC sheeting with a traditional FC batten over it, about 40 mil, 18 mil. Um, so yeah, it's just batten jointed. And then at the bottom, we have a, um, a, 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 a little um, metal edge along the uh, um, bottom of the materials, which mm -hmm. just sits over the slab. That's just to keep the water away, but it actually really benefits in terms of bushfire as well because it really closes up those gaps um that's what we would prefer to do i know that you know some of the um james hardy matrix products uh, do go up to about 40 if you put uh, an extra layer behind it i would prefer to see things that have well sealed express joints as opposed to shadow joints um, where things are held together with glue because, you know, those could fail over time and you wouldn't notice it. So I would always go with something um, as well sealed as you could you could do. And, and those batten joints are pretty good, really. Right. And can I just add, you're right, um, 3959 does permit butt jointing on the basis that the gap might only be a millimetre, very little. And the fact that you are required to have fire resistant, energy efficient sarking behind anyway. Mm -hmm. I'd question them, why do they allow the plastic jointers in the eave, the typical little, you know, uh, H shape. And the comment is its contribution to fire, should it catch a light is so minimal, we can ignore it. So yeah, butt joint certainly covering it even better. You're right. right. Um, Ellen, a question for you. Any comment on the efficiency of car fridges? Uh, well, it depends. Um, a lot of car fridges are what they call thermoelectric devices, which have no moving parts, and they are extremely inefficient, typically, like PGs. Um, however, there are car fridges available that have small compressors, uh, which can be very efficient. And also, uh, they're very sensitive uh, to the quality and thickness of the insulation that is in them. Um, you know, the, the yachting fraternity are actually pretty good, highly insulated, very efficient, low voltage um, fridges. Right. I think outside the box. Uh -huh. All right. Um, Jay says, uh, what? What would you what would you advise what would advice be for a house on wooden poles? Can they be made fire resistant? Like should you reclad over the timber or replace the timber? Well, the typical thing is you probably can't easily replace. Um, mm -hmm. So chances are you're going to have to put a non-combustible skirt uh, to cover the poles because as I said, the lowest 400 millimeters is where the regulations are most concerned. So that's where so much of the debris or plant affects the, the construction. So that would be the first thing I would look at without knowing more. And I suppose, you know, as we were saying before, that might be a good uh, location for your intumescent paint, you know, if, right. if um, it's not going to be, if, if, if it could be well maintained, I suppose. Mm. All right, uh, next question from Liz. Is there a silicon that is suitable for sealing? 
yes. Uh, it mightn't actually be a silicon in the conventional material sense, but there is gunnable mastics, mastic being the generic term, that are particularly fire resisting. In one of my projects site this today, Timbercrete natural stone product up against the eave. As we walked around, I pointed out that there was a gaps of one to five millimeter. Architect's instruction to builder, fill that with a intumescent sealant. Um, major brands uh, all produce it without mentioning names. Okay. Right. Uh, Beverly, how effective have roof systems been assessed? Are there e easy access to a single pitch roof and would be turned and would be turned off as solar oh, backup generators should? I think the question about um, roof spray systems generally. I can't quite understand the question. Anyone? Yeah, sorry, didn't quite understand what you were. Yeah. Was, I, uh, I think we'll leave that one because I, I can't understand. Um, where are we? In relation, uh, no, let's go to Catherine. Advice, please, on two decks to be repaired and extended at a holiday house in Arizona from kitchen, living room at first story. Currently timber with timber posts and one deck. Uh, timber rotting on two to four posts I want to extend. Which materials? Um, should they use for all of those? The decks, post, roof, timber tables, and benches. Paul, I can make comment, but... Well, me. yeah, I, I suppose the first thing is to work out what your bowel rating is. Um, that's going to determine um, what you can use, I suppose. Um, right. And then, you know, um, yeah, consider, consider that, consider... The location you know it's rotten timber well how long how quickly did it rot you know do you want to replace it with the same thing or do you want to something that's going to last longer you know um yeah also are you going to be able to get structural timber at the moment so you may look to be going for steel anyway hmm. can i add to that that hmm. um because almost all my projects are bushfire prone to varying degrees i almost now never use timber externally I'm playing for safety because last year's mega fire is the start of what's going to occur more frequently with great severity, as Alan and people in the industry well know. So mm -hmm. I now always use the rolled metal bearers and joists. So that's not the uh, eye beams that people think of. It's lightweight, it's folded metal. So it's long spanning, it's strong, no maintenance. You can get it in color bond and Easy, easy peasy, just a straight substitution. I may, in low bowel areas, still want to use lovely hardwood decking because it's beautiful material. But again, more often than not, I'll be using modwood or the Hardy's product, um, which is obviously works to a higher bowel level. Because certainly my belief is we're living in a fool's paradise if we only work to the minimum requirement, bearing in mind that the risk is getting higher all the time, every year or five. Right. Um, I've got a question here on embers. Uh, under ridge capping, I have tried fiber, fiberglass or rock wool strips underneath to block the eaves. Is that a good idea? Rock wool is what's written into the regulations because it's made, it's a mineral fiber, which is part of the, um, waste product from steel production. So again, uh, Alan will tell us all about it, but it's obviously inherently a good material to use because it, again, it can deal with heat where fiberglass or polyethylene or anything will just melt. However, there used to be, you used to be able to buy uh, ridging capping and the like, which followed the profile. That's not readily available, but I really wish it was back on the market because not many people are going to pay for someone to, to do the cutting. But really, that is going to be, if you're in a higher extreme bowel, I did it for my house. I would encourage people, if they take the time, to, to do it for theirs. There is, there is also the new colour bond. Um, I'll, I'll look it up uh, right now, but there's colour bond... A product which they're bending and it's called uh it's, it's so there's no joints needed on the corners and they claim that's going to reduce um uh or, or greatly improve the, the 
the bushfire resilience of colour bond. So, um, yeah, I can look that material up as we go to the next question. Please, and can I just add to that? Um, you can commonly buy what's called a profile filler for the different metal profiles. So it's a polyethylene, but there's only one brand that I'm aware of, which comes from Adelaide. If you buy Lysart's BHP products, you get it automatically. It's tested to BAL40. It actually has a fire inhibitor compared to other brands on the market, which whilst they stop the breeze coming through are not particularly fire resistant, particularly if you've got a fire in the gutter and the flame is trying to get in under the roof. So profile closers, certainly metal, non-combustible, excellent. Otherwise, the one which has been tested to Val 40, try to avoid using the everyday cheapies. They don't, they don't work. So the material is called Color Bond Custom Flow. So they actually, it's, 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 it looks quite cool as well, but yeah, they're claiming that that will, and it, it, it will, and, if you think about it logically, it will reduce some of those areas where you potentially have those gaps. Okay. Um, there's, we can only have a couple more questions here, I think. One that's uh, different uh, is um, to what we've already asked. Are there fire resistant downpipes for water collection to the water tank? All we have in WA is PVC pipes. Is there an alternative to PVC? Yes and no in that what I do is still use PVC because you can seal it, you can have a wet pipe system as they call it, but I put it within a color bond 100 millimeter sleeve. So 90 mil plastic inside a 100 millimeter metal sleeve. Not perfect, but mm -hmm. from my understanding, that's still the best available on the market. Paul, any comment on that? Yeah, I don't know anything that's better than that solution. Okay. So, um... I'm thinking, oh, I'll give one, one final question and then we need to go. It's 25 after now. So we'll go to the, the closing because we've got a, a bit extra tonight since it's our last evening. Um, Tony says the fire triangle, triangle shows that for a fire, heat, fuel and air is needed. So I guess that the removal of air is the main goal for reducing the likelihood of a house burn. Is this summary correct? <laughs> It's simplified. <laughs> um, and you were talking that you can't completely get rid of the air because uh, it causes, it can cause uh, damp and all kinds of other things that we've talked about previously in these sessions. Yes. So I, I think you need to treat the whole thing as a, as a yeah, the, the house and, and land as a whole, don't you? And it's, uh, they all need to work in, in conjunction with one another. Yep, absolutely. Starting with the big picture, move through to the detail. Mm. Any any final comments from short, short final message from each of you? Oh, I think there was one question that we we that was written there about, you know, should we should we not be building medium density um, housing in, in bush fire prone areas? I mm. think that we can I think that we can still build medium density. I think it just needs to be. Uh, done with the uh, correct design, the correct materials, and considering everything that's been addressed in these presentations, really. And can I add that more and more jurisdictions around Australia are effectively stopping development past BAL 29, in particular Tasmania, Queensland, and so on. So we're going to see increasing stringency that you, you own land, they don't pay compensation, but began to make it harder and harder, leading to impossible to build in some instances in some jurisdictions. Just be aware of that. Okay. But look, I don't have anything further to say about retrofit other than do it. <laughs> okay. Ellen, <laughs> the final comment. Uh, well, well, I'd recommend that people look back over the uh, recordings of the previous sessions because I've basically listened in to all of them and found them uh, at one level, fascinating and really informative, and another level, a bit frightening. <laughs> yes, we have some work to do and a real responsibility if we're if we're not going to just be frightened about it all. I think and that isn't that the message that's come through for me is that there's a tremendous responsibility on us, not just our emergency services, um, 
and to be actively involved in in our properties. Yeah. I've got some work to do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nigel, Alan, and Paul for for a, another fabulous e evening. Um, yeah, you've you've all made the the evening enjoyable and very informative. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to now invite Sophie to say something before I walk you through uh, a reminder about an event coming up. Uh, we, we've mentioned it a little bit, but I'll, I'll go through a little bit more. So Sophie, over to you. Thanks, Tricia. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've been uh, helping out behind the scenes for these last six webinars, and it's been really great to get to see uh, all of them and to learn so much from all of our presenters and uh, from Trisha, who has been a fantastic host this whole time. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us, um, especially to the people who have been joining us this entire time. I know there are people who've been at all of the sessions and that's really great. Um, you know, as someone from Northern California, which, you know, has in recent years experienced really um, terrible fires every year, it's really great to see uh, people taking these uh, subjects so seriously and, uh, you know, thinking really in depth about how we can keep each other safe and keep our homes safe, uh, the ways that we can do that. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, Renew is the organization that's presented all of this, and we have presented all these sessions for free, and we are really happy to be able to do that, but we can't do that without your support. So if you have any ability to make a small donation this end of financial year, we would deeply appreciate that. You can also become a Renew member. Uh, our memberships start at just $34 and give you access to the fantastic Renew and Sanctuary magazines, which uh, if you're interested in the discussions that we had tonight, you would really enjoy. Many of our presenters have also written uh, quite a few times for Sanctuary and Renew. And if you join before October this year, you'll go into the running to win a heat pump uh, worth $5,000. So that's a little extra uh, initiative for joining. Um, the links to all those things are in the chat. Thank you so much again. We really appreciate all of your support and we hope you enjoyed the presentations. All right, back over to you, Tricia. Okay, thanks, Sophie. Uh, so my final comments here, uh, a series of speed, uh, speed data sustainability expert. We've, we've talked about these a couple of times or they've been mentioned. Uh, these events will be held as part of this project um, they will provide the opportunity for people who are rebuilding to sit down with experts, designers, and builders to dis discuss their plan. Sorry, to discuss their plans one on one. Starting in late July, bookings for these events will open soon. People rebuilding will be given preference. And again, thank you all for attending. Hope we will see you in future renew activities. Our webinar will now close.